Hey everybody. In this video, we're going to look at improper integrals, and this time we're going to concentrate on compound integrals requiring a decomposition into two or more simple improper integrals. So what do we mean by this? Let us call the following improper integrals simple. We could have an integral on a semi-infinite interval from a to infinity or from negative infinity to b, or we could have an improper integral where one or the other of the endpoints of a finite interval uh, are poorly behaved, as in, say, a vertical asymptote. Now, we've seen in the last two videos how to deal with each of these types of improper integrals, and we're just going to call all of these simple because they have one endpoint that's bad. And the way to handle each of these is to take uh, a definite integral on a finite interval that's normal, the function's continuous, and then you let the one endpoint sneak up on the bad spot. So you take a limiting value of an integral you understand, and you let that endpoint approach um, the bad spot, so to speak. And what do these all have in common? A simple improper integral has exactly one problem endpoint. You just handle one bad endpoint at a time. In this video, what we're going to do is learn how to decompose more complicated improper integrals into the sum of simple improper integrals. So for example, you could imagine a function that looks something like this, and you're interested in finding this area under the curve, this signed area. And uh, maybe, so we're going to be talking about integrating from negative infinity to infinity. There's a lot going on here. There's uh, integration to negative infinity, integration to infinity, and there's not one, but two vertical asymptotes. So we really need to figure out what we mean by this improper integral. We're going to start with a concrete example. Suppose you wanted to integrate function 1 over x squared plus 1 from negative infinity to infinity. Now we've got integration to both negative infinity and positive infinity, so both endpoints, so to speak, are problematic. Um, and it's definitely not a simple improper integral, so we're going to have to deal with this. Now, although both endpoints are a problem, the function's actually continuous on the open interval uh, from negative infinity to infinity, the whole real axis. And so we can choose any argument we want and write the original integral as a sum of simple integrals. So we'll just choose some argument c, and then we could look at the simple integral from negative infinity to c, and then the simple integral from c to infinity, and we're going to analyze each of those separately and add them together. So we would have as a definition, this improper integral would be the sum of these two simple improper integrals. Although we have the freedom to choose any argument, in most problems like this one, there is an obvious best choice. So in this example, we can exploit the even symmetry of the function by choosing c equals 0, which we will do. And in that case, then, we'll have this decomposition of the original integral from negative infinity to infinity as the sum of the integral from negative infinity to 0, and then 0 to infinity. So let's concentrate on the right-hand integral, just from 0 to infinity. Um, we can treat this. This is a simple integral. We know how to work this one. So we're going to integrate from 0 to k, and then look at the limiting value of that as k goes to infinity. Antiderivative of 1 over x squared plus 1 is arctan. We plug in, subtract, take the limiting value. The arctangent function has a horizontal asymptote at pi over 2. And so here we find that this integral is equal to pi over 2. It converges to the value pi over 2. We've got this other simple integral. And we could actually calculate this directly. We could explicitly find the antiderivative, look at the limiting value. We actually did that in uh, the first video on improper integrals. But let's think of this um, using symmetry. We, we could exploit the even symmetry of the function 1 over x squared plus 1. The graph is symmetric across the vertical axis. What this tells us is that this area should really be the same as this area. And the area on the right actually is finite. It's pi over 2. So the area on the left has to be pi over 2 as well. And, and again, you can verify this with a direct calculation. But um, the even symmetry guarantees that if you found this convergent improper integral on the right side, the even symmetry tells you that uh, this improper integral on the left side is going to converge to the same value. Now we put these pieces together, add them up, and we find that this improper integral actually converges to the value pi. 
So here's the strategy for working with general improper integrals. Given a non-simple improper integral, identify enough arguments to allow you to decompose the integral as a sum of simple improper integrals. As long as your choice of arguments yields simple integrals, these arguments may otherwise be chosen arbitrarily. So you should definitely look to exploit this fact when you make your choices. Choose them to be easy arguments or arguments that exploit symmetry that's available to you, and so on. Next, you'll analyze each simple integral separately. If all the constituent integrals converge, we declare the original integral to converge. And in this case, the value of the original integral is taken to be the sum of the values of the constituent simple integrals. And if any one of the constituent simple integrals diverges, it's off. We declare the original integral to diverge as well. An important point here is you have great freedom in choosing your arguments to decompose the original integral into a sum of simple integrals. And you might wonder if the, how, what effect this will have on um, your results. And it's an important fact to realize that the choice of intermediate arguments does not affect the convergence or divergence of the integral. And in the case of convergence, it doesn't change the value of the integral. So it really doesn't matter. The, the punchline will not change. You should choose the arguments so that you get simple integrals and you know, you should choose the arguments to uh, make your calculations go as smoothly as possible. So let's look at this example. Here's an integral from zero to infinity. This is not simple because we have a vertical asymptote at one endpoint and we're integrating to infinity at the other endpoint. So we'll choose an argument in between. We might, there's no symmetry to exploit, but we might as well choose one. It's a nice simple argument. So we can decompose this improper integral as the sum of the simple integral from zero to one, and then the simple integral from one to infinity. So let's find the antiderivative of one over x squared. This is of course is just the antiderivative of x to the negative two, and the antiderivative is going to be negative x to the negative one, the opposite of the reciprocal function. Integral from one to infinity. So we're gonna take our limiting value as always, Here's your antiderivative, plug in the endpoints, you get the expression one minus one over k, and the limit as k goes to infinity of this is one. So this integral, this simple improper integral converges. But we've got this other one to look for here, and we've got the integral from zero to one, and when we do this calculation, we go from k to one, and we're gonna look at the limiting value of this as k goes to zero from the right. So plug in our endpoints into the antiderivative negative one over x, and here we're looking at the limit of one over k minus one as k goes to zero from the right. And that's gonna make this term blow up. So this diverges to infinity. So this simple integral diverges to infinity. And we see that the original integral diverges because we need every one of the constituents to converge in order to say that the original integral converges. And that doesn't happen here. So this is a divergent integral. However, the area being all positive allows us to say that the integral actually diverges to infinity because um, it's clear that all this area contributes positively. So this integral diverges, but at least we can interpret it as diverging to infinity. Example C, we're gonna integrate the reciprocal function from negative infinity to infinity. Now we've got to break this up into four pieces. Integral from negative infinity to negative one, negative one to zero, zero to one, and then one to infinity. So you'll notice that we have this vertical asymptote and then we have two infinite endpoints. And so this is gonna require four different integrals, a choice of two intermediate arguments. So one and negative one are pretty simple arguments, so we'll, we'll choose those. So here we have it, this decomposition. Now the only way for this integral to converge is if all four of these converge. So let's just pick one. Let's pick the integral from one to infinity. This is a pretty simple calculation. Antiderivative of one over x is ln of x. Plug in k, one, subtract. Look at the limiting value. Limiting value of ln of k as k goes to infinity is infinity. So this integral on the right diverges. And so now you don't even need to test any of the other three because you automatically know by definition that this integral diverges as well. So we can just say it diverges. By the way, if you had chosen any of the other three, it turns out this isn't even a close call. All, all four of these integrals diverge. So you would have quickly figured out this integral diverges no matter which of these you had chosen. 
Now, some of you might be looking at this and saying, wait a minute, the reciprocal function is odd. And we've been using symmetry. These regions are congruent. I mean, you could spin this graph 180 degrees around the origin and it wouldn't change. And if those are congruent regions um, and, and one region is above the axis and one's below the axis, shouldn't they just cancel? Signed area should just cancel then. In which case, this integral should be zero. Why isn't this integral simply equal to zero? So the warning here is you must beware of arguments based on infinite cancellations. What do we mean by this? You should avoid canceling infinite areas of opposite sign. You should also avoid canceling infinite collections of regions of the same, even finite, size. Both of these lead to trouble. So let's see how that works in our example. So first of all, let's get some facts on the board. The integral of the reciprocal function from one to e is ln of e minus ln of one, which is just one minus zero or one. The integral from e to e squared is going to be ln of e squared minus ln of e, which is two minus one, which is one. And more generally for any natural number n, the integral from e to the n to e to the n plus one of the reciprocal function turns out to be ln of e to the n plus 1 minus ln of e to the n, which again simplifies to 1. So with these facts in hand, let's see how infinite cancellation leads to trouble. We'll return to our reciprocal function. Notice there's a, a different scale here because we're going to need some room along the x-axis to see this argument. So what we're going to do is select arguments at 1, e, e squared, e cubed, and so on. We'll keep marking off the positive x-axis in this fashion, and then we'll go and mark off the negative x-axis with the opposite of these arguments as well. So you have this infinite collection of arguments, which is gonna be helpful uh, in a moment. And so now what we'll do is we'll notice that this area is one, as is this area, as is this area, and so on. So the, this was the calculation we did a moment ago when you integrate the reciprocal function uh, from e to the n to e to the n plus 1, you're guaranteed to get 1 for your value. And similarly, using symmetry, these will all be negative 1 on this side. All right, so here we go. First of all, we would expect the integral from negative 1 to 1 to be 0 since these are congruent. And so this, of course, is our attempt to use infinite cancellation. So let's assume that the integral from negative 1 to 1 is, in fact, 0. Next, we'll notice that these two areas cancel. And, and these are offset. Notice I'm use, going from e to e squared on the right side, but negative e to negative 1 on the left side. And then we're going to keep moving away from the origin and find pairs of regions that cancel each other. So if you believe you've got them paired off correctly, then you would expect that these two regions should have equal and opposite areas, which is to say the integral from negative infinity to negative one plus the integral from e to infinity should be zero. Once again, this is assuming infinite cancellation. And one last detail is that the integral from one to e, we calculated already, is equal to one. So now we're going to put it all together. We've got these three equations and we're just going to add these. The right hand side of the equation isn't too hard, that's just one. And the left hand side of this equation is the sum of these four integrals. But now look what happens. The arguments are set up in such a way that the interval combination law kicks in quite nicely and this should just give us the integral from negative infinity to infinity. But just not two minutes ago, we had already concluded that infinite cancellation should allow us to say that this integral is zero. So here's the problem. Infinite cancellation has led us to the conclusion that zero equals one. This is a contradiction, no good. When you deal with improper integrals, you need to go right back to the definition, which is put in your auxiliary arguments, your intermediate arguments, to give you only simple improper integrals, evaluate each of those with the known rules, and then look at all the integrals. If they all converge, then your improper integral converges. If any one of them diverges, the improper integral diverges.